you have your Bibles, I ask you to go to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We're going to be there in a moment. But I want you to repeat after me. With God, there's always a way. And by faith, I will find it. Now we got to do this a little bit more heartily, okay? With God, there's always a way. And by faith, I will find it. Now, now listen to this very carefully. I'm going to give you an absolute absolute. What I'm going to tell you is an absolute truth. And it, Jesus is the one who said it in Matthew 19. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. This is absolutely fundamental that you, if you don't believe that, you can say it, but if you don't believe that, you do not have faith. Because it is the ingredient of understanding what it means to walk in faith. It's not about what we think or what we can do, it's what God can do, and we fully trust and believe that. Now, now granted, little caveat, I recognize that every one of us in this room should be self-aware and humbled, right? So when we say all things, let, let's, let's, let's be, if you will, real, not ideal. <laughs> what I mean by that is I'm going on 60 and, and it's pretty fundamentally a fact that this age and this body is not going to get into the NFL, okay? <laughs> now, I think most of you would agree that's part of because scouts don't know what they're looking for. I get it. But anyway, um, but the fact of the matter is I'm not going to be in the NFL, but that's not what we're talking about. Because that's one reality. But listen to this carefully. I think it's a whole other mindset when people resign themselves to their current situation as if this part of their story is somehow now the whole story. I want to say that again. There's a lot of people, followers of Jesus, who are facing maybe a turbulent time, a difficult and adverse time, and they resign themselves to somehow the facts that this current moment is somehow my whole story now. And it's not. What God can do is fundamental and foundational when you really want to grasp what faith is. But look at the screen. I want to show you what the Bible says in Hebrews 11. It says, faith is the assurance. We're going to get a definition of faith. Faith is the assurance. What that word assurance means is the confidence, the substance of one's nature. But here's the one I love the most. It's the legal document that shows that you have the right to possess what you have. It, it's like my mortgage. Kay and I have a mortgage. Our name is on it. We purchased it. It's a legal document that if you're in my house without my permission, you have committed a crime. You do not have a right to be in something that I own. That's the assurance that the writer of Hebrews is talking about. That this faith is that kind of assurance of everything that I have, everything that I hope for, long for, live for, and it is my full conviction, though I can't see it. In other words, I don't have to see it. God does, and that's enough. I don't have to get it. God's got it. That's enough. And my faith secures that, and I'm confident of it. How about you? Don't answer. Look at the screen. I want you to read with me from Proverbs 16. I think it's a verse that so often sometimes gets misinterpreted or misimplied. And, and I just want you to read it with me. We can make our plans. Now stop there. We can make our plans. By the way, I encourage it. I encourage people to write goals. We say often, if you aim at nothing, you hit it every time, right? If you don't know which road you're taking, any road will get you there. So I have goals. I have things that I look at on a consistent basis. So we can make our plans. I think God invites us to. But here's the key to the verse. 
finish it with me. But the Lord determines the steps. It is the Lord that determines our steps. In other words, I might be going through a moment in time. I've set a goal. I'm on this path. And all of a sudden there's an obstacle. And too often what people do is they see the obstacle is somehow maybe that's God saying, ah, they give up, they quit. And I've seen it all so many times in my life. I have these steps, these goals, these aspirations and things. But one of the things that I've learned is, but it is the Lord, if I could say it this way, who finishes. Maybe what I started. But he always finishes what he starts. He's got it. We don't have to always get it. With God, there's always a way. And by faith, I will find it. Let me ask it in a question form. What will it take for you and I to live in this world of what if? Because we live in a world of what if. It's just how you look at what if. What is it gonna take for us to really grasp this world of what if? And I contend it's either by faith or by fear. Because what ifs are everywhere. I hear them all the time. People come up to me and go, yeah, but pastor, what if it doesn't work out? What if, what if I reach out and ask them and they like say no? Like, like what if they actually see the real me and they don't like me? That's called living by fear. Because you know what I say? Well, only know if you do it. Yeah, but what if? So you're going to live according to a lie of something you don't know the answer to rather than step out by faith and maybe discover that what if it does work out? Like, what if you ask them and they say, yes. What if you stand up and they see the real you and they love you? What if Paul would have never stood up in Ephesus? What if Kay and I never came to Sioux Falls and planted a church? What if? When Kay asked me to marry her, I said, no, I didn't, okay. When I, right. but, but what if? See, th this is what I'm trying to help you understand, but please watch this. If you live by fear, you will never see a way forward because you've already decided it's finished. And it's a lie. Because we all know if we knew how things ended, it would change our decisions, wouldn't it? Like if I make this investment and it's going to multiply by 10, well, okay. And yet the Bible tells me that I already know how it ends. Therefore, I can step out in faith. Because with God, all things are possible. And in faith, I'm going to find it. Because God never reneges on a promise. It's a beautiful thing. Listen to what the word of God says. If God is for me, and he is, if all things work for the good of those who love him, and they do, if greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, which is true, I can do all things through Christ. It gives me strength. And let, me, let me make it more personal. I want everybody here to look at me. I want you to take a deep breath. Okay, hold a second. Now, I'm going to have you blow it out. Don't blow it out yet. You can hold it because I don't want you to turn to someone because I don't know if you brush your teeth. Okay, so anyway, all right, now blow it out. Do you know what that tells me? I want you to look at someone right now and I want you to go, you're alive. Come on, look at him. Turn around. You're alive. Do you know what that tells me? If you have breath and you have a pulse, God's not done. Because you're not done. That's a beautiful promise just in itself. If, if you're breathing, he's not finished. I think we need to understand faith. And I want to help you with that in this story. Luke chapter 5. 
because our God is a God of possibilities. He's a God of new paths. He's a God of redefining and reinventing. He's a God of wonderful works and unforeseen ways. If he needs a road, he'll make one. If he wants to move a mountain, he'll cast it into the sea. He built the world. He runs the world. He owns the world. He's got it. Maybe you got fired. God didn't. Here, here's a thought. Maybe you're exactly where you need to be right now. So quit telling yourself you're finished before he's even gotten started. And quit voting yourself off the island when he's the one who put you on it. He has you. He's in control. God isn't going to check the forecast to see if the timing's right to bring in the harvest. He doesn't consult human agendas. He's not going to, if you will, reach out to the political offices to see if there's a better moment or more promising way. With God, there is a way. And by faith, I'll find it. But that happens when we grasp faith. So if you got your Bibles, Luke chapter five, Luke chapter five, verse 17. This is a short little story. And what's crazy in the first few words the entire impregnation of it is right there. Watch what it says. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of the religious law were sitting nearby. And I like this little addition in the New Living. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. Here's something you just need to know. Anytime you stand up and you speak for Jesus, there's always a critic in the crowd. For 25 years here, every time I've preached, I know that there's people coming in this room. They're not coming to be fed. They're coming to see if they get to be fed up. They're, they just come in looking, oh, is it what he's going to say? It's wrong. Because I'm the theologian. And I know. <laughs> Trust me, I got all kinds of those letters. Okay. And the Lord's, but here's the key. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. By the way, it's always with Jesus. Here it comes. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. That line alone is huge. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. Father, I love this story and I pray that you will speak as we look at it, pull it apart and may your spirit have its way and may our faith begin to grow in ways we've never seen possible in Jesus name. Amen. amen. A paralyzed man for faith filled friends who do something amazingly radical and in doing it, they're going to help us see something beautiful and grasp something amazing, faith. So if you got your notes, I want to unlock from this story some keys to the new you, to a new way of thinking of faith. And here's the first one. We've got to learn to always lean toward Jesus. We have to learn to lean toward Jesus. Don't miss this. I told you. It says this, that some men picked up their friend and they leaned towards Jesus. Because here's what I know in the story. Jesus is in a house that they're not. We also know that they weren't there when Jesus was there because it says when they got there, they couldn't get to Jesus. So the fact of the matter is, there is a group of guys with a paralyzed friend who they love, who are not there, but something in them said, but we need to lean towards there. This is important, you get this. Evidently, these guys believed that there was something or someone greater than their current environment, situation, or circumstance that was worth leaning towards. That the end result 
would be greater than their past or their present situation. Because what I do know is there's a man paralyzed. It didn't happen in the moment. Maybe it happened at birth. Maybe it happened because of an accident. But he's paralyzed because of something then. And four of his friends saw something that could be. And they leaned toward Jesus. Here's the deal. What you believe right now about Jesus is what you're going to receive from Jesus. Because it was Jesus who says, according to your faith, it'll be done. What do you believe? These four men must have believed something amazing. They grab their friend and they start towards Jesus. I don't know if you've ever been told, I grew up doing some ranching and farming and my, my boss would always say, and I'd be cleaning out the hog pens and I'd have my pitchfork. It got to be grueling work that I'd find myself sometimes where I'd just stab it in the ground and then I'd just lean on it. Same thing would happen when I was in the hay loft and we we're haying the horses or, or other things. It just got tiring. And so I'd lean on it. And he'd always say these words. You've heard them before. You know, you'll get more done if you stop leaning on that shovel. You'll get more done if you stop leaning on that pitchfork. Here, here's what I've learned in life. We all get tired. The question is, when you do, what are you leaning on? What are you leaning towards? How do you approach your marriage once it's in crisis? How do you deal with a child when they're wayward? How do you deal with a boss or employees? What are you leaning on? What are you leaning towards? Your ideas, your understanding? What is it? Can, can I tell you something about the past you need to know? The past, whether it's successful or not, tends to paralyze. Did you know that? Whether it's a painful past or a promising past, it has a tendency to paralyze. In other words, the hurts of yesterday can easily silence the hopes of tomorrow. But just as true is your victory of then can keep you from enjoying the current or future victories of tomorrow. I know that to be true because I grew up in the state of Nebraska and trust me when it comes to their football program. <laughs> you know what I hear the fans always talking about? The 80s and the 90s. If we could just get back and what they do to those young people is they keep them from enjoying the game today because they're trying to repeat something that doesn't need to be repeated. And it happens. The past paralyzes. And you miss what can be in the moment, what God wants to do now. Because we have this idea of what it should look like, what the church should be. None of us know what the church is supposed to be. We have little ideas. We have principles in our Christian walk. But what does God want to do now? But yet most churches get built on what we knew. I hear people coming all the time. Well, when I grew up, when I grew up, And we hear people fighting for that all the time, like as if they know. Here's my thought, go plant a church. But what could the church be if it's God's? What could the church be if we come in with this emptiness to seek what God wants to do rather than bringing in what we think he needs to do? This is why Paul wrote these words. We must leave behind the past and lean toward what lies ahead. Don't miss the statement. Our joy in life can only be realized when we embrace the capacity to lean towards what's next. Let me say it again. Our joy in life can only be realized when we embrace the capacity to lean towards what's next. That's the joy. If they would have never got up, picked their friend up and leaned towards Jesus, they would have never experienced what they got to experience. 
But it doesn't end there. Here's number two. We have to learn to live forward in Jesus. Because with God, there's always a way. And by faith, I will find it. We will find it. The Bible tells us that faith cometh by hearing the word of God. But it doesn't just end there. James adds, but it's not just hearing the word, it's doing the word. What good is hearing if it doesn't put your feet in motion? See, every day of our life is in front of us, not behind us. Did you know that? Every day of our life is in front of us. So when we face an obstacle and we come to an obstacle, you ready for this? To God in faith, it's an opportunity. When we come into a mess by faith, God's going to write a new message. When you and I face a testing time, God's just preparing to give you a new testimony. These guys, don't miss this, lean towards Jesus, pick their friend up, but when they get there, they got a problem. They can't get into Jesus. The road is blocked. The way's got a, a, a problem to it. But something in these guys, at least one of them, he looks at the obstacle, but by faith, he understood, I need to get to Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. I'm not going to focus on my problems and my circumstances. Evidently, one of them went, hmm, there's the roof. I wonder if one of his friends says, but we don't own the house. I don't care. They can sue us. I can fix the house. But only Jesus can fix my friend. I can fix the car. And yet how many people miss the faith because they're all wrapped up in the fear? They forget what it means to live forward. To realize the end result's what matters. They're not lost in the moment. Every day is in front of us. You know, there's a story in Deuteronomy. You're welcome to go there if you want. Deuteronomy 34, and it begins in verse 1. And, and if you don't know the story, there's a guy named Moses. We just call him Mo right now, okay? So there's a guy named Mo, and, and, and God's been using him for a long time. Raised up in Egypt at 40 years of age. He does something that really causes fear. So he leaves Egypt and goes out into the desert and starts herding sheep for 40 years. Then God shows up and says, I got to do something with you for the next 40 years. I, I like the way there's, a, there's a, a, a pastor who says it this way. For 40 years, Moses thought he was someone. For the next 40 years, he felt like he was no one. For the last 40 years, God showed what he can do with a no one. And he goes back and he leads God's people for 40 years out of Egypt to a land that God had promised to his people. And here we are in Deuteronomy 34, and it says that God took Moses up a mountain. He did that a lot. The people were very, if you will, affluent to the fact that Moses would go up a mountain, then he would come back from the word of God. And he'd go up a mountain, he'd come back with the word of God. He goes up the mountain. It's a mountain called Nebo, not Nemo, Nebo, okay? All right? He goes up the mountain and God shows him the land that he promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then he turns to Moses and says, but you don't get to go in. And it's almost like God kills him. Because the Bible says, and then Moses died. This is really how it unfolds. You can read it. He goes up. God says, see, you're done. And then the Bible says that God buried him so no one could find him. Which is really kind of interesting. And I wonder if God did that because too often we like to erect a tombstone so we can go back and worship the wrong person. So God made sure that Moses is gone. Like, ain't nobody going to find him. There ain't going to be no gravestone. He's just gone. Now, what's even crazier is the Bible says he was 120 years of age. I find this interesting. And it says, yet his eyesight was clear and he was as strong as he ever had been. So you'd stop and go, well, why would God take him out? Like a dude's in his prime. He brought him for 40 years. Because the story's not about Moses, it's about God. But here's what I want you to get. This is the faith I'm talking about. Don't miss this. Because in Deuteronomy 34, verse 8, 
they grieve. And all of a sudden, there's no mo. No. <laughs> but God's going to say, but listen, what I want to show you is you can no mo. And it's in verse 9. The first two words. No mo. You want to know mo? Now, Joshua. And that's the story over and over and over. Moses, my servant's dead. Joshua, my servant's dead. Jacob, my servant's dead. David, my servant's dead. Peter, my servant's dead. Billy Graham, my servant's dead. Why do I do that? Because I'm into now. Watch what I'll do. Watch what I can do. When you choose to live forward, when you grasp this, see with God, don't miss this. With God, it's never, and I hear people do this all the time. They come into a problem, they're like, now what? And God's going, what are you doing? With God, there's never a now what. There's just now who? Now who? When I, I was with Moses, I'll also be with Joshua. I was with Joshua. Now I'll be with David. I was with Keith. Now I'll be with Noah. That depends if you live for it. Of course, if you want to chase a celebrity, which a lot of Christians do in the world today. There's only one celebrity. His name is Jesus. I choose we live forward and chase him. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is why Paul wrote, forget what is behind and strain. Do you know what the word strain is? It's where we get the word to pursue. It's where we get the word to live. I lean toward and I live forward to what lies ahead. These four guys do this. Because with God, there's always a way. Can't get in, but there's a roof. And by faith, I will find it because the end result is never the focus of the problem. We got a paraphrased friend that we care about. We got to get him to Jesus. We just cut a hole. What's the owner think? We'll talk to him later. Let's just get him to, who knows? Jesus might just heal the hole, all right? But Jesus is the key. That's what it means to live forward. Not just lean toward him, but live in him every day. See, folks, please hear this. I don't know what tomorrow holds for Keith. People come up and go in this transition. So what are you going to do? I don't know. I've had some things on the horizon. A couple of those doors have closed. Okay. But didn't that concern you? No. Because, watch this. If I'm living to what's next and I'm not living in the now, I don't deserve what's next. Every day I get up, I read my word and I pray. And maybe that's all it is. But if that's all it is, I'm living for my Jesus right now. And to God be the glory. What I do know is I'm at peace with what God is doing because it's about him. We lean toward, we live forward, but here's number three, and I wanna bring the team out. We have to grasp this, don't miss this, because if we don't get this, the first two don't really mean anything. We lean toward, we live forward, but here it is. But we have to do it together. We have to do it together. This is so important. Look at our story, and I'll highlight the thing I don't want you to miss in one verse. When they couldn't reach him because of the crowd, they, went up to the roof, and they took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down right in front of Jesus. Let me just tell you, it's hard to lower a sick man if one of the corners is missing. Because one of the corners is more concerned about what he's getting than what he's being. Man, I hear that a lot. How come we're not doing this? How come we're not getting this? How can we do this? My goodness, what are you doing? How come you're not walking with this or serving that? Why are you not washing their feet? How about we just come to the house of the Lord and worship and see what he's going to do? 
Folks, if there's something I'm not a fan of in the college football world, it's called the portal. But to be honest with you, I think it ruined football. Now I know some of you come up because you're gonna talk about, yeah, but you have to understand what it does for this kid. You're right. It's about them, not team. That's why a lot of the great coaches are stepping away. We didn't recruit them so they could play today. Recruited because we're trying to build something. But then they don't get what they want, so they pick up and go somewhere else. Now, I'm not here to argue that. I'm here to argue this. What I fear is that somehow we as Christians put a portal in the church. Well, I'm not getting what I want, so I'll go to that church. Well, I'm not getting this, so I'm going to that church. I'm here to tell you, I don't know where in the Bible it's about you. What's crazy is that you were such a fan when you were getting what you wanted, but if you were actually getting something you were wanted, then why are you not being a part of what God's building and what he's future? It's called a portal. Can't count on you. Folks, teamwork is what makes God's dream work. The eye cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. What I find interesting is people come and they go, oh, I just love this church. But then they tell the rest of the body, don't need you anymore. I don't get it. It's what team is what got you here. Don't forget that when you start making a future decision, what you think is in the best interest of you. For God will never sacrifice his body for your best because the body is his best. The eye cannot say to the foot. What I find interesting in this story is, is how it ends. Evidently, they understood the need to lean toward and live forward. And they were going to do the right thing no matter what, even if there was problems in that, because we just got to get our friend to Jesus. What happens, I find, is very interesting. And it's in verse... 20, but I'll go back to 19. But they couldn't reach him because of the crowds. They went up up to the roof, took off some tiles, and they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Look what it says. Everybody look up here. And Jesus, sick man, seeing their faith. Sick man, but seeing their faith turns to the sick man and says, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't even heal him. Maybe because Jesus was fore, foretelling of the cross that was coming, that the greatest miracle is to forgive us of your sins, not that you get to walk again. Because better for you to come into heaven paralyzed with a right relationship with me than having legs that work and go to hell. However, Jesus does healing, but it's not because of their faith. It's because of the critics' faith. They all get upset. Who are you? And Jesus says, which is easier? That I tell someone their sins are forgiven or heal them. And he turns to the man and says, get up and walk. He did the miracle for the unbelievers. But the faithful got their miracle. but it was the team that got him to the dream. It's amazing how often I hear people always talking about what's in it for them, what's in it for them. Noah and I were talking and we hear it now and then people, I just need to go a place I get fed. The only other person that talks that way is a toddler. Feed me, feed me. Which by the way, when people tell me, boy, pastor, you fed me so much but you're gonna pick up and go somewhere else? Obviously, I didn't feed you anything because if you're actually getting fed, why don't you go be the food? Because I remind you the way Jesus dealt with the disciples. Do you remember when they, the loaves and the bread, the fish? Remember, the disciples had it. Jesus broke it and put it in their hands. Do you remember what he told them? Eat it. No. He told the disciples, go pass it out. They were hungry too. But that's what a disciple does. They go out and help others. They feed. 
they feed. I will tell you this, the spirit of God that's spoken in through me each and every weekend for the last 25 years is the exact same spirit that is on Noah and will speak each and every day forward. God doesn't tailor his spirit for your best interest. He's the spirit and that's the best interest. He made a donkey speak once because people wouldn't listen to the prophets. Sometimes a new voice is one of God's greatest gifts. As I was with Moses, I will be with Joshua. And so the people of Israel obeyed Joshua and did just as the Lord commanded because Joshua was full of the Spirit. My word goes forth. It will not return to me, God said. It will always accomplish what I desire, what I wanted to achieve. So here we are, a new you. And if we're going to be people of faith, really, then we have to always lean toward Jesus. We always have to live forward in Jesus and do the right things regardless. Just get up every morning. That's what Keith does. Spends time with the Lord, prays. Spend time with the Lord, prays. Spend time with the Lord and praise. But we do it together because the eye can't say the foot, I don't need you. Folks, listen, change is inevitable, but not with God because he doesn't change. And that's exactly why we can lean, live, and love each and every day. Repeat again, in him, there's always a way. And by faith, we will find it. Listen to the words of Paul, for I am convinced that he who began a good work in us will perfect and complete it. For he who calls us is faithful, he will surely do it. For I know the one who I put my faith in, and I am convinced he is able. <laughs> God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, here comes all fear is gone. Because I know he holds my future and life. The living just because he lives. Do you believe that? God sent his son. He's got a name. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died. To buy my part, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Do you believe that? Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because all fear. All fear is gone, oh, because I know he holds my future. Believe it. And life is worth the living just. Father, you're not done. You're not done. Just even in this moment, for 25 years, I've had the incredible privilege. But what do you want to do in the next? What are we really committed to? What do we understand? Are there going to be obstacles? Sure. 
Things we don't understand, things we don't get, things we'll have to face, absolutely. But because you live, you're the possible God in the face of humanly impossible things. And because of that, by faith, we'll find it. We'll walk, we'll lean toward, we'll live forward, and we'll do it together. We will lean toward, we will live forward, and we'll do it together. And how many people's lives, sins will be forgiven because of our faith, because of our faith in who you are. You're such a good God. And all God's people said, amen. Because he lives, God bless.